Just a recap on David's life, where we are so far. So David, uh, uh, David was a shepherd. All this we know. Saul was rejected as king. This is kind of where, where we've been the past couple weeks. Saul was rejected as king. David has been anointed uh, by Samuel to be the next king. We already know that David has defeated Goliath, you know, sling and stone, Goliath's sword, chop his head off, all that. Uh, and uh, and he has, uh, David has become lifelong friends with Jonathan and lifelong enemies with Saul. After David kills Goliath, Saul made, uh, makes David a commander in his army. He gives his, uh, daughter, uh, uh, his, his daughter to marry David, not the first daughter. He takes that daughter and gives it to someone else. Then he gives the next daughter. Michael loves David, and, uh, and uh, uh, through that marriage now, David is the son-in-law to the king. David is, uh, is a prince next in line for the throne. And this, the, the pop culture, the pop music of the day was... Saul has slain his thousands, David has slain his ten thousands. Today we're going to see that that song has actually spread all over, not just Israel. It is a very popular song in Philistines uh, country. So it's a very, everyone knows the song, uh, Saul has killed his, uh, slain his thousands, David killed his uh, ten thousands. I see this as uh, it's on every, every radio station that you uh, turn it on. Because David is now celebrity status. He is a commander of the army and God is blessing everything that he does. Saul is afflicted by a jealous spirit. Saul is continuing operating in this jealous spirit, becoming David's lifelong enemy. David is dodging a couple of javelins thrown at him, and now David is on the run. Remember, Jonathan shot the bow, long or short, run away, stay here, and it was run away. So David is now on the run. That's where we're picking up in the life of, uh, of David today uh, with uh, David being on the run. Today we're talking mostly in 1 Samuel chapter 21 and uh, 22, Psalm 34 and 52, also uh, companion stories with this. So we're talking here in 1 Samuel chapter 21. I'll just start with a couple of, uh, a couple of verses to, uh, to get us going to understand a little bit about this story and what we're supposed to take from it. 1 Samuel 21. David went down to the town of Nob to see Ahimelech the priest. Ahimelech trembled when he saw him. Why are you alone, he asked. Why is no one with you? The king has sent me on a private matter, David said. He told me not to tell anyone why I'm here. I have told my men where to meet me later. Now, what is there to eat? Give me five loaves of bread or anything else you have. So David comes to the town of Nob. So the, the town of Nob is not something that we've, uh, you hear a lot about in, uh, in uh, the Old Testament. The town of Nob is home to the tabernacle. So there's a whole story. Eli was the priest before Samuel, and the Philistines come and take the Ark of the Covenant. They get afflicted with a bunch of diseases, and they bring the Ark of the Covenant back, and it's in shambles. And so it's now hidden away. But the tabernacle is now in the town of Nob. The tabernacle is there. It has an empty holy of holies. The Ark of the Covenant isn't, uh, isn't there at the moment. But there is a, a priest who's operating the tabernacle, and this is Ahimelech. Uh, if you uh, follow, the, follow the story here, you have Eli was the high priest, Hophni and Phinehas. Remember, they were not doing good things in, the, in church, and they were uh, killed. Uh, we go down a, a, few, a few generations, and now we're at Ahimelech. So this is Eli's great-grandson. So that's who we're talking to now. David comes in. He is on the run from King Saul, going to the uh, town of Nob, headed to the tabernacle to talk to, uh, talk to a priest that he knows, Ahimelech. And he asks, uh, he asks uh, whenever David comes down, he, he's asking for supplies. He is now on the run. He, had, he has no weapons. He has no food. He has men with him that are not the, the, the normal king escort. Again, this is David, this is son-in-law to the king, this is commander of the army. Everywhere David would go would be a whole troop of people that are official Israelite army, an official garb uh, ordained by the, the king to go wherever he would go. David has a group of companions, but no one that is officially escorting him where he's going, which is why Ahimelech asks why David's alone. He comes to him and says, I'm hungry, do you have anything? And Ahimelech is trembling. He said, this is, this is not ordinary. Why are you coming to me? And why don't you have anyone with you? There's no official uh, representation here of Israel. And so David gives, uh, gives this story. Look at uh, verse 2. The king has sent me on a private matter. Okay, so here is the first lie that David records, and now there are other lies to come. But here's the first time David lies, and he says, I am on a secret mission. It's so secret, the king doesn't even know about it. You know, so this is, he says, I'm on a private matter, I'm on, on, uh, on official business, but it's secret, which is a lie. So David here lies to 
the priest in charge of the tabernacle, and the priest with this, uh, with this information, uh, uh, again, I don't know how much he truly believes that, because if you look at, uh, look at verse 1, Ahimelech the priest trembles when he saw him. Why are you alone? He feels something fishy is going on here. Uh, maybe there's rumors. There's, uh, you know, there have been a couple of javelins thrown, so I think there has been uh, some bad blood here. I'm sure that gets around. So Ahimelech says, uh, why are you alone? He's trembling here. David lies to him and says, I'm on official business of the king. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a secret mission that he wants me to do. And so David says, I'm hungry. What is, what is there to eat? And so if you read uh, through this story, uh, Ahimelech says, you know, we have no food here. All we have is the show bread. All we have is the sacred holy bread that is set out for the Lord. And there's so much uh, so, so much uh, symbolism, there's so much going on here with this showbread, but just know it is sacred bread. Only priests can interact with the showbread. So this is, uh, this is holy bread, and David says, I am starving, let me take that. It, it was baked yesterday, you know, so it's day-old bread right before the Lord in the, in the, whole, um, in the tabernacle. And so the priest prays and says, yes, go, you can go ahead and take, uh, take this bread. What's so interesting about this specific, uh, this specific scenario is that, that David takes the show bread, and then Jesus mentions it later on uh, in Matthew chapter 12. And so I really thought, like, what am I supposed to be learning here about David eating the show bread? Is there some bigger truth I'm supposed to be learning here? And as much as you can learn is what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 12. So go ahead and turn there if you uh, have your Bible handy. Matthew chapter 12. So this is when the disciples have taken grain right from the stalk, and they've been, uh, they've been eating it, and uh, they are now getting accused of harvesting on the Sabbath. So this is the, uh, the Pharisees are coming to uh, say, why are they breaking the law by harvesting grain on the Sabbath? Uh, Matthew 12, verse 3 says, Jesus said to them, Haven't you read in the scriptures what David did when his companions were hungry? He went into the house of God, and he and his companions broke the law by eating the sacred loaves of bread that only the priests are allowed to eat. And haven't you read in the law of Moses that the priests on duty in the temple may work on the Sabbath? I tell you, there is one here who is even greater than the temple. But you would not have condemned my innocent disciples if you knew the meaning of this scripture. I want to show you mercy, not offer sacrifices, for the Son of Man is Lord, even over the Sabbath. Here we have this story about there is a law that David is not allowed to break, and the Pharisees respect David above everyone else. The Pharisees respect King David, and they know that it makes sense that David had to take the showbread. He was God's anointed, and he was uh, starving, and this is the way he was going to save his life by eating this, uh, eating this bread. So the Pharisees have already recognized that there are some times when uh, the practical truth of protecting human life is better than, than the law. They recognize that, and so now when they're accusing uh, Jesus and his disciples for breaking Sabbath, there's a reminder there of there is something, there is something better, uh, better than the law. Jesus is quoting Hosea 6, verse 6. He sa- uh, Hosea 6 says, I want you to show love, not ac- offer sacrifices. I want you to know me more than I want burnt offerings. This is what Jesus is quoting. I want you to show mercy instead of offerings. I want you to show love instead of offerings. And this leads us to our first note for today on your handout. Our takeaway that I want you to see from this is God's law shows us how lost we are and how truly merciful he is. When we show love and mercy to others who sin against us, we echo this statement, Jesus is better than the law. You see, among the, among the reasons the law exists for order and, for, uh, and to know the heart of God, it truly is there. We show how lost we are and how truly merciful he is. So when we break the law, we know that we have broken the law. We know that we deserve punishment. And when God pours out his mercy, we know what, we would, what would have happened uh, had he not shown, uh, shown his mercy. Jesus is better than the law. Echoed throughout the book of Hebrews Jesus is better than the law. So he's the God of the Sabbath. He's the God of all law. He is, uh, he's the God. He's not breaking law. He's better than the law. But as David eats the showbread, he also says, I am without a weapon. 
and uh, I, I'm, I'm defenseless. I'm on the run. I didn't plan to be on the run. You know, this was a last-minute decision to be on the run for my life. I didn't plan provisions, and I don't have a way of defending myself. So he talks to, uh, to Himelech about this as well. In 1 Samuel 21, verse 8, David asked Ahimelech, do you have a spear or sword? The king's business was so urgent, again, he's lying. <laughs> the king's business was so, uh, so urgent uh, that I didn't even have time to grab a weapon. I only have, this is Ahimelech, I only have the sword of Goliath the Philistine, whom you killed in the valley of Elah, the priest replied. It is wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. Take it, I take that if you want it, for there is nothing else here. There is nothing like it, David replied. Give it to me. So here we have a familiar weapon that David now grabs. And I just have this like, you know, Zelda moment. Da, 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 da. And so he has, this, he has this weapon that he's held before. Uh, so, and, and I'm trying to go through and see the, 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 the sword of Goliath. You know, what's going on here? How did that all happen? So, uh, you know, David sling and a stone knocks Goliath down. And so this is not this is not the fatal blow necessarily that kills Goliath with the stone. Uh, he knocks him down. There is a reason to cut off his head. I think this guy might get, might get back up. Uh, so he grabs the sword of Goliath as just a child, <laughs> just a, a teenager, and he goes down and just hacks off Goliath's head. And I have not done that before, but I imagine that's a kind of a, yeah, this is a weighty sword. This is a hard, I don't feel like this is just one slice and it's done. I feel like he's sawing. I don't know. This is, this is a rough, gruesome moment. So David holds up the head of Goliath. He holds up the sword. He takes Goliath's armor. Later on, it tell, uh, talks about how David takes Goliath's armor and puts it in his tent. I assume the sword would have been uh, with that, but it doesn't say specifically. Just trying to find out where, how did the sword of Goliath get to Nob in the tabernacle? This is not, this is not the Valley of Elah. This is not uh, uh, in, in the king's palace. This isn't on display as a big trophy for everyone. This is in a cloth hidden in the tabernacle. Why is the sword of Goliath there? And the only thing I can think of, so just conjecture, is that David, so grateful, and we see a lot of psalm about this, David is so grateful for the deliverance that happens that day that as a token, he, he, he devotes it and dedicates it to, to the God in the tabernacle. So the sword of Goliath, for somehow, was in David's possession and now is in God's possession at the tabernacle. I believe David might know where he last ha- held the sword of Goliath. He looks, he's looking for a sword. There is no other sword like it. Tabernacle seems to be a good place to go find it, but I don't know that he was really hunting it down. For some, some reason, the sword of Goliath is now at the, um, is now at the tabernacle. David, if you can just uh, you can just kind of imagine that moment of David. He touches the sword and he is flooded with gratitude. He's written songs about this before. This moment, he's flooded with gratitude. He's flooded with praise. He's flooded with joy as he remembers how God delivered him on that battlefield that day. This was the day that changed his life forever. Whenever he saw God in a mighty, mighty way as uh, God delivered him from that giant. David and his companions uh, flee to Gath. So David has the sword. He's fed. He's fed his companions with these loaves of bread. They take the sword and they go to Gath. So this is the next part of this story. They go to Gath to King Achish. Uh, Abimelech is uh, who is said uh, said in Psalm uh, in uh, Psalm thirty four. Uh, uh, so he goes to King Abimelech. So there's Ahimelech and Abimelech. Don't get them confused here. One's a priest and one's a wicked Philistine king. So Ahimelech is the priest. Abimelech is the king. King Achish is what it says in this. He goes down to Gath. Gath is in uh, a Philistine country. And Gath happens to be. So imagine David here, sword of Goliath. He goes to Gath. The sword of Goliath has been in Gath before because Goliath is the champion of Gath. That is what everyone called him. So now the sword is returning to his hometown. Everyone would know this sword. This is a very culturally appropriate thing where a sword that is built for a giant would be probably abnormally long. It would probably be significantly different than everyone else's sword. And the champion of Goliath, you have action figures of Goliath all over the place holding a little sword that everyone knows is Goliath's sword. So now David is in Gath. Philistine country holding the sword of Goliath, and he is terrified because he gets arrested. He gets arrested there in, uh, in Gath. David is afraid of what King Abimelech will do to him. 
And so he pretends to be crazy. So David here is, is he's captured, he's arrested. He is scratching at doors, drooling on his beard, pretending to be crazy so that he has not found out that he is the threat that he truly is. There's a song that everyone reminds King Abimelech about. David has killed 10,000s, and a lot of those were Philistines. A lot of those had to do with foreskins. I mean, there was a whole lot. That was the dowry for his wife. This is rough stuff. And so King Abimelech sees David here, says he's drooling on himself. He is scratching at the door. He's a crazy person. I don't want any more of those in my country. So this is verse 10. Uh, So David escaped from Saul and went to King Achish of Gath. But the officers of Achish were unhappy about his being there. Isn't this David the king of the land? They asked, isn't he the one the people honor with dances, singing, Saul has killed thousands, David is ten thousands? David heard these comments and was very afraid of King Achish of Gath, uh, what, what he might do to him. So he pretended to be insane, scratching on the doors, drooling down his beard. Finally, King Achish said to his men, must you bring me a madman? We already have enough of those around here. Why should I have someone, uh, someone like this be my guest? So here David is delivered from the wrath of King Achish, King Abimelech, in the land of Gath, that he would definitely is, is known by just appearance. People know who King David is. Holding the sword of Goliath, clutching it for dear life, knowing that he's going to be found out, and he's drooling on his beard, pretending to be insane. What a crazy crackpot uh, idea. This is the way he's going to be delivered. And the king says, we have crazy people in Philistine country already. We don't want one more. Dismiss him and send him out. What a wild deliverance of the Lord that this is, because this is, I mean, truly, David's barely trying here. I mean, he's pretending to be insane, and God delivers him again here. What I think is important for us to look at as we're looking at this, uh, at this story is David has the sword of Goliath, and it is a reminder of past deliverances. David, ha- with the sword of Goliath here, is, is empowered by this testimony of God's victory in the past, and God delivers David again with yet another plan that doesn't seem like it's going to work. A slingshot and a stone does not work to kill a Goliath, and drooling over your beard after killing 10,000 Philistines does not seem like that's going to work. And yet David is empowered by, uh, by the testimony of God's deliverance in the past to deliver him for the future. The deliverance from your past is your testimony for future victories, both for you and for others. When we look to God for help, we are radiant with joy and without the shadow of shame. This is a direct quote from Psalm 34, which is what we'll read at the end today. Do not forget what God has done for you. I've been listening a lot in uh, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers in the past like week and a half, Uh, so uh, I got a lot of law in my head at the moment, Uh, but a lot of complaining as well. There is so much complaining in the book of Numbers as just time and time again, and God threatens to wipe out everyone from complaining because they forgot. They forgot the deliverance God has already done. If you want deliverance in the future, remember the deliverance in the past. There is a thought here for those of us who have been kind of had a year of just being rocked by the Holy Spirit. Uh, So there has been this change as if everything that happened before this infilling didn't count. And I will challenge you, do not disrespect God's deliverance in that way. Everything in the past, he was there. He was present. There are gifts that you operated in before you understood what they were. There are things that he has done for you before you even understood that he was doing them. Your past victories are your testimony Share them, and it doesn't have to be just within the past year. He's been present. He's been active. He has been in your life, and you have the sword of Goliath in your hand now. And in, in around, surrounded by enemies, you might feel like you're just scratching at the door and drooling on your beard. <laughs> I've been convicted lately uh, that I have been, uh, a lot of times I'll, I'll tell people at work, like we had a crazy night at church last night. And it was insane. And I use all this terminology that has to do with the Holy Spirit, and I speak about it as a mental health condition. And I've actually been really convicted lately that I cannot refer to the Holy Spirit 
in crazy terms, in insane terms. And this is the way I speak anyway, but I really have just been thinking, you know, how many times in the New Testament have people been praying, a sp- praying in the Spirit? They must be crazy. They must be drunk. Every, the world sees this as craziness. David here is being seen as a crazy person, and yet he's being delivered by the Lord. Uh, I don't know that this directly relates, but I just would challenge us uh, let's not speak about the Holy Spirit in crazy terms. Uh, what we thought was what we have mocked before, we have now realized. It's, we, our eyes have been opened, and God is uh, showing us that he is doing a new thing in us. Your past deliverance is your testimony, but it's not just for you. It should encourage you. Tell your testimony to anyone who will listen, because it is building faith in them as well. As we get down to the next uh, portion of this uh, in chapter 22, here's where we see uh, David's lie really comes back. Uh, so David talked to, king, uh, talked to the priest Ahimelech. He escapes out of uh, Gath. And now he's on the run, uh, Cave of uh, Abdullam. And so he's on the run with companions. He has 400 people with him now. It increases to 600 soon. I mean, he's just really gathering an army of people who's just, who are with him. Uh, God is uh, leading people, I believe, uh, to, uh, to be with him. And as David was speaking to Ahimelech at Nob, uh, some, uh, someone sees David speaking. Someone witnesses this, Doeg the Edomite. So this is an evil, evil, evil person. Psalm 52, all about how evil, evil, evil Doeg is. And so uh, Doeg saw, saw, sees David speaking to Ahimelech. Ahimelech gives him food, gives him a weapon, and Doeg is just taking notes. David even sees Doeg and says, this is going to come back and get me, the, the, the dog days of uh, David. So he's going to go back, and uh, David is uh, going to be uh, he's tattled on. So Doeg goes back to King Saul, and in chapter 22, King Saul is just jealous in a furious rage. Why haven't we killed David yet? Why haven't we caught him? And Doeg has a story to share. He says, I know at the tabernacle in the, land of, uh, in the land of Nob that David has been given provisions. And so uh, he, uh, Saul says, who's, who's done this? King, uh, the priest uh, Ahimelech, bring Ahimelech here. And uh, King Saul then, uh, then just starts yelling at the, at the priest here. Uh, verse 11 in chapter 22, King Saul immediately sent for Ahimelech and all his family who served as priests at Nob. When they arrived, Saul shouted at him, Listen to me, you son of Ahitub. Uh, what is it, my king, uh, Himelech asked. Why have you and the son of Jesse conspired against me? David is now a curse word. In, uh, king Saul doesn't say the name David very often. So why have you and the son of Jesse conspired against me, Saul demanded. Why did you give him food and a sword? Why have you consulted God for him? Why have you encouraged him to kill me? And he is trying to do this very day. But sir, Ahimelech said, is anyone among all your servants as faithful as David, your son-in-law? Why? He is the captain of your, uh, of, your, of your bodyguard and a highly honored member of your household. This was certainly not the first time I consulted God for him. May the king not accuse me and my family in this matter, for I knew nothing at all of any plot against you. Ahimelech says, I pray for David on a daily basis. He is your son-in-law. I pray for all the leaders here. Why in the world? I consulted, of course I consulted God for David because uh, uh, David is one of the leaders in our land. I, had, I knew nothing about this plot, but Doeg has filled King, Saul, uh, King Saul's ears with lies, and Saul is filled in jealous uh, rage. And Ahimelech, uh, King Saul pronounces, uh, pronounces death upon Ahimelech and all his family. And even uh, Saul's own bodyguards will not carry out the order. They won't kill uh, Ahimelech because he's a priest. And all the other, uh, all the other priests, his family, uh, has been uh, uh, announced, decreed that they will die. So Doeg takes it upon himself and says, I'll do it. Uh, so Doeg, who would do anything for money, who would do anything with this evil, murderous heart, uh, takes it upon himself and slays 85 priests right then. This is, Doeg takes it further. He goes to, the, uh, to Ahimelech's family. All the men are related to Ahimelech, all the women, all the children, literally babies, cattle, sheep, oxen, kills them all. It's an amazing moment whenever Saul was rejected by God for being king because he did not kill all the Amalekites, did not kill the king, did not kill the cattle. This is why Saul was rejected, and yet Doeg carries out Saul's order to the letter of his law, killing all 
all cattle, all babies, all men, killing everyone of this, uh, of this line. And only Abiathar, uh, um, Ahimelech's son, escapes. One person escapes to tell of this. Uh, to tell of this. Th- this is a national tragedy. In a country that the, the tabernacle and the Levites and this whole order is set up as uh, the voice of God, this is a national tragedy that all Israel will remember forever. Uh, this, this terrible, terrible moment happens here. Psalm 52 gives a lot more uh, uh, indication about how evil Doeg is and how much David is uh, trying, to, uh, trying to escape this, uh, this evil. But when you look at this national tragedy, there are many factors coming in that relate to, there's so much sin happening here that it's a really complex storyline. And when you look at why do bad things happen to good people, Ahimelech and all his, all, all, you know, 85 priests and his, all his family and every, everyone dies here, why do bad things happen to good people? And you can point to certain sins, but this is a, there's always a complex storyline that happens in, some, in, uh, in these big tragedies. Think about it. King Saul is demonized by a jealous spirit. There, is, uh, there are crazy outlandish uh, things that King Saul says about, you're plotting against me. He has this whole story built up in his mind about how uh, David is plotting against him with Ahimelech. Doeg, the Edomite, loves evil. This is what Psalm 52 talks about. He loves evil. But also, a story, if you go back to, remember I said Ahimelech is the great-grandson of Eli, the high priest? Eli, the high priest, there was in 1 Samuel chapter, uh, chapter 2, it talks about Hophni and Phinehas. They're literally sleeping with women in church. They're literally stealing from the church. Wicked, wicked deeds happening here, and Eli would not correct them. Uh, it is pronounced upon Eli that all of his descendants would die. There would only be a few left to tell about how awful the destruction was. This is what's told upon them. Now, shortly after that, that's when the Philistines invade Israel. They take the Ark of the Covenant. Eli, uh, what a way to go. He leans back in his chair and you know, breaks his neck. I literally remember being a child being told that that's what would happen if I leaned back in my chair. So, I mean, like, that's the way mom got me not to lean back in the chair and, you know, at the kitchen table because uh, Eli died that way. Um, but Hophni, Phinehas, every, everyone is killed in this, uh, in this story, uh, and there's just a few left of the line of Eli during that story. But this curse that is placed upon them because Eli did not correct his children, and because of this curse, there is a generational curse, third and fourth generations, it's mentioned many times in the Old Testament, how these curses last, what you do affects your children, your children, and your children's children to the third and fourth generation. Eli's descendant, Ahimelech, is destroyed, all of his family, and there is only one that survives, Abiathar, as even given this second phase of destruction that happens generation, uh, you know, four generations, ba- uh, four generations back. So why do bad things happen? Well, there's, the king is, uh, is, has been demonized. He has a, has a, a friend, Doeg, that is loving evil. There's a generational curse already on this family, uh, because of uh, the wicked deeds that ha- have been done in the family. And then at the bottom of this is David's lie. Why did this happen? David lied. David did say, I'm on a secret mission. I, this is okay. Give me support. So there's a lot of these, uh, these things. There's a lot of sin that has happened here. And whenever you look at it, you think, well, you know, David lied. It wasn't that bad, right? <laughs> like, I mean, like, it wasn't as bad as Saul's, uh, you know, Saul uh, you know, gave, the, they gave the decree. Doeg is the one who murdered everyone. And all of this, uh, this, this priestly line had been cursed already. And David, uh, David lied uh, about it. And that kind of got them... Uh, got all this, uh, all this rolling. But if you look at 1 Samuel uh, 22, the end of it, the last, uh, last few verses, verse uh, 20, only Abiathar, one of the sons of Ahimelech, escaped and fled to David. When he told David that Saul had killed the priests of the Lord, David exclaimed, I knew it. When I saw Doeg the Edomite there that day, I knew he was sure to tell Saul, now I have caused the death of all your father's family. At, at this point, Abiathar, it's doubtful that Abiathar knows that David had anything to do with this. You know, at that point, Abiathar says, I mean, he is, he is crushed. His entire family, everything that he knows is dead. Abiathar is the only one who survives. And he comes to David and tells him all that's happened. And David doesn't say, wow, Saul's pretty bad. He doesn't do that. 
He doesn't say, Doeg, my goodness, what a murderous evil. And he doesn't say, boy, yeah, your family's really had a lot of this. Remember your great-granddad and all this? Like, there was a curse put upon him. I mean, that was the deliverance. At no point does David at all pass blame to anyone else. He takes ownership for his part of this tragedy. You will do things that hurt people. You have done things that have hurt people. David takes responsibility for his part in this. David is not great because he is, he is sinless. David is not great because he doesn't sin as much as others. He actually sins more, I would say, if you had to like count up how many. David is not great uh, because of his sin-free life. David here is great because he recognizes his sin and immediately repents about it, immediately confesses it to those who are involved, and immediately comes back accepting God's mercy and his grace. David is great here because he lives shame-free. We walk in shame. There are people who you have done things that have hurt people, and you live out that, you replay that in your mind on a daily basis. When we sin, we cause hurt and pain on others. And people live in a tailspin of pain that they caused other people. Uh, depression after doing something that has hurt someone else. Uh, it, it picture someone in a, in a maybe they're drunk in a, in, a, in a car and they end up causing someone else's death and lives are ruined forever. What a terrible thing, the drunk driving and a fatality because of it, a terrible thing, and yet that one person still has sin for which Jesus died. They live in a tailspin, living shame, uh, shame their, their entire life. It's an open door for demonization. When you're living and walking in shame, knowing that, yes, the truth is you have hurt people. Yes, you have caused pain. But giving that to him, accepting his mercy. David didn't take his faults lightly. Even though he may have been the smallest contributor to this tragedy, he found his grace in God quickly. Psalm 52, it talks about Doeg, but he's, uh, David says about himself, but I am like an olive tree thriving in the house of God. I will always trust in God's unfailing love. His unfailing love through your sin, through, your, uh, through uh, uh, what you've done to hurt others, he has unfailing love. God's goodness endures over every evil action. Standing before God without repentance is religious pride. Next. When we sin, it is religious pride that causes us to self-punish and live in shame, ignoring God's forgiveness, His mercy, and His love. Uh, there are pastors who have fallen from, from grace, <laughs> fallen from, from whatever it is that they have done, and they, they discount their ability to serve God anymore. There are pastors who have done some, some really terrible things, and yet there is mercy, there is forgiveness, and there is love. And there is no time limit on how long you're supposed to self-punish before you revel in God's love. You have a prayer room today, you're allowed to have one tomorrow. You know, if you got to confess it, get it all out, keep going. And if you mess up again, you just delve right into God's repentance, his mercy, and his love. Because it is, it is insurmountable. It is, you're flooded with his mercy and his love. And all we have to do is accept it. David caused the slaughter of a city. Yet he found a way to rejoice in God's mercy and love. Quit rediscovering how sinful you are. Settle that you're wicked and stop rehearsing your past evils in your head. Stop being surprised when you fall. Immediately bring it to God and shine light on it and be forgiven. You sinned. There is no set time for you to sit on the bench. There is no set time for you to self-punish. Get back in the game. You hurt someone else. You cause them pain. Repent. Make restitutions. Praise God for forgiveness and move on. He has great things for you, O oh sinner. He has great things for me, O oh sinner. I've hurt others. I've caused pain. There's no excuse to sit on, uh, sit on the bench. You broke his law, but accept his love and mercy and show that love and mercy to others. This is what uh, God was talking about whenever you, remem uh, if, when you remember here about the grain. Whenever you, you, you are reminded that you broke a law, 
And God says uh, the mercy and love is better than sacrifice. This is what it means. Showing mercy, showing love to others is better than sacrifice. When we sin, he shows us mercy and love so that we can show mercy and love to others. Last, how to live shame-free. You are not supposed to live in shame. You are not supposed to live crippled by fear that someone will find out all the wicked things you've done. You're a sinner. I know it. They know it. Everyone knows it. Recognize we're sinners. Don't be surprised whenever you sin, but here's, what, here's the secret that David found. He lived shame-free. He repented to God, and he confessed to others. Everything was lived out in the open. It, there's, there's great context here for when Jesus, uh, you know, they were going to stone a woman found in adultery. Uh, Jesus, it was, it was made known. She repented. It was confessed to others. Hey, go and sin no more is what he said. You know, so yes, this is not a license to sin, obviously, but go and sin no more. Repent, confess to others, make it known. You've hurt others, you're living in shame. This is the way to make it known. David immediately confesses his part in this national tragedy to Abiathar. Don't walk, don't walk around with their scarlet letter. His goodness endures forever. You can live shame free. In Psalm 34, ask Kara to come up and read it for us. Psalm 34 gives us this, that this is what David, David wrote whenever he is drooling in uh, the jail cell uh, with, uh, with uh, Abimelech. This is the mercy, this is the grace that David knew and shares it with us through this psalm. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. They looked unto him and were lightened and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around about them that fear him and delivers them. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusts in him. O oh, fear the Lord, ye his saints, for there is no want to them that fear him. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. Come, ye children, hearken unto me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. What man is he that desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Keep thy tongue from evil and thy lips from speaking guile. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and his ears are open unto their cry. The face of the Lord is against them that do evil, to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. The righteous cry, and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart, and saves such as be of a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but... The Lord delivers him out of them all. He keeps all his bones, not one of them is broken. Evil shall slay the wicked, and they that hate the righteous shall be desolate. The Lord redeems the soul of his servants, and none of them that trust in him shall be desolate. Father, we thank you for this house. We thank you for your blessing that you've put on it. We thank you for um, for redeeming people from the hand of religion. And God, you have brought us out into freedom, and we worship you for that. God, I pray that you would put your spirit on this place, God. A hunger for you like never before. God, I bless every single person here who has sacrificed in their homes and in their hearts and in their prayer closets to bring, to, to, um, to host what you're doing here, God. I pray that everybody who comes into this house will encounter you in ways that will change your lives forever. God, we pray today that we would be um, open to you. Every eye would be open. Every ear would be open. Every heart would be softened. God, that you would be celebrated, King Jesus. That you would be lifted up, Holy Spirit, that you would have your way. We bless you in Jesus' name. Amen.